Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very, 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 very special edition of Orlando Magic Live, our triumphant return. You may be wondering why you're not seeing me um, if you're watching this live on YouTube. Um, it's because I'm having some weird technical issues. Uh, so I may cut out or not. I think it's the video, so I'm going to be just audio. This is Philip Rossman Reich of Orlando Magic Daily. Uh, I'm joined, as always, by our good pal, Zach Oliver of Orlando Pinstripe Post. Zach, how are you doing? I can see you. You can't see me. I'm doing better than you are because everyone can see me, uh, and uh, I'm not having technical difficulties as of now. As of, as of now, but technology has a way of doing things, and apparently my laptop traded uh, a functioning video camera for uh, a, some, some cap flexibility and a uh, pair of second-round picks that I'll never receive. Uh, of course, the big, the big trade, uh, it seemed like the big trade of the trade deadline came from the Orlando Magic. It happened Tuesday, not Thursday, so we had some time to digest it. What were your initial reactions to the deal that sent Tobias Harris to the Detroit Pistons and brought back Ersan Oyasova and Brandon Jennings? At, at, the, at the start, I was a little you know, questionative of the motives of why they would do this trade. You know, Jennings coming off the Achilles injury has struggled this season. Ersan Oyasova is somewhat inconsistent and pretty much, you know, in – in a roundabout way, a clone of Channing Fry. So the Magic already went down that route, and it didn't work. So the deal didn't make a ton of sense at first. Once I started looking at you know cap numbers and and everything, then it really started making sense. You know that that was the real underlying theme for both deals that the Magic made was opening up long term cap. Flexibility. Our pinstripe post that's going to be out tomorrow morning. You know, the Magic are looking in at the short term with getting Jennings and Ilyasova, be it for thirty games, and but they're also still looking at the longer term and the potential of maybe luring a guy like an Al Horford or you know what Harrison Barnes. They're going to have some options this summer, but they're not great. Yeah, uh, it's it's going to be really interesting to see what they do this summer. Uh, when you look at it, it's very much, you can't judge this deal, I don't think, until uh, until you see how they use that cap room. And, and obviously, cap room is this, it's it's like, they're like draft picks almost, or this anomalous figure. You don't know what you're going to get. It's it's the prize behind the, behind the door. You could end up uh, with something really good with a couple of max guys, or you could end up with, uh, Charlie Villanueva and Ben Gordon, uh, as the Detroit Pistons did uh, way back when. Uh, so, you know, the pressure's still on Rob Hennigan to deliver. I, I don't think that part of the equation as far as evaluating Rob Hennigan goes. Um, as for my initial reaction, I, I've, I'm not a huge Brandon Jennings fan. He, he screams gunner to me, and, and I don't, don't think that works in today's NBA. Uh, if the Magic are still serious about making the playoffs, which they've all said that they are, um, I wonder how much Jennings in his current state, you know, coming off of that Achilles injury is going to help. Uh, I think Ilyasova is an upgrade over Channing Fry. He does a few more things um, better and differently than, than Fry, but at the same time, it doesn't really move the needle for me. I, I, I kind of feel like the team didn't take a step forward. And, and I think, and, and, and I'll, I'll get your comment on this uh, next on the uh, two. I think the general sense is you should have gotten more for Tobias Harris. Uh, before I move into your answer, I do want to remind uh, all those that are that are watching us live. You can drop us a question in the Q and A section if you're watching us on on Google Hangout, or you know, I'm sure there's a way on YouTube to get into the access panel to uh, to drop us a question for the Q and A. Where we'll we'll take your questions throughout the show. Um, obviously, a lot going on with the Magic and their future in these deals. Um, this is this is. I mean, Tuesday was a big big day in Magic history. Uh, with the trade that they made, trading away Tobias Harris uh, for these two guys. Um, but Zach, back to the, back to that question: Could the Magic have gotten more for Tobias Harris, and should they have gotten more for Tobias Harris? I think that it's possible they could have gotten more, but and and this is something that both of us have said multiple times over the last month and a half. It takes two to tango. Yeah, you know, and, and that's I think the big reason why we didn't see some of the big names. You know, Dwight Howard wasn't dealt, Al Horford wasn't dealt. Um, you know, no real big names end up getting moved 
huge because, you know, not value. Because te- teams aren't going to just go in and trade, you know, two or three first-round picks for one of those guys when they can become free agents and leave this offseason. Now, of course, Tobias Harris is a little bit different since he's 23, just signed a four-year contract extension. But at the same time, Tobias Harris is a lesser player at this time than both of those guys, uh, even with both of their injury concerns. So I, I think that the Magic probably could have gotten more from a team if somebody got real desperate, but I think that they they did a deal that they really liked that they think can make an impact now and then later. I, I think I think there are a few things to consider on this point that, that fans sometimes forget. Um, general managers have, a, have access to a lot more information than we do as fans. Uh, at the end of the day, while, I mean, let's, let's say, for instance, a, a fan in Sacramento, um, as I know we talked a lot about a, a Tobias to Sacramento deal, a fan in Sacramento may really like Tobias Harris. But it does. It, it does not matter what that fan think. What that fan thinks of Tobias Harris. What a group of fans think about Tobias Harris. At the end of the day, there are thirty guy. Thirty guys. They're all guys. Um, that comment for later. Um, they're the they're they're the ones that make the decisions and make these evaluations on guys. And so, if Rob Hennigan surveyed the twenty nine other GMs and got a got a good a, a good assessment of who values Tobias Harris and what they can get. It may not be what fans think it is. Um, so it, it's very possible, just like with Aaron Aflalo, because I think uh, a few readers have, have pointed this out to me as, as I've criticized the deal. We said a lot of the same things when the Magic traded Aaron Aflalo for Evan Fournier. And while you know, certainly Aflalo was a good player, uh, Evan Fournier has turn, turned into a pretty good player too and turned into a good player for this team specifically. It's It's... As, as, as Hennigan said, you can't assess value in a vacuum. It's, it's what's good for your team. And so the question then becomes, did the Magic get enough value for Tobias Harris for this team? And I think we're going to – we'll find that out, obviously, in the next 30 games and whether this team improves, whether they, they kind of steady the ship after that rough January, and, and whether they make that push for the playoffs that, that everyone wants. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, whether or not they – you know gave up on Tobias or, or, you know, whatever the decision was or the reasonings to move Tobias Harris were, uh, he's been plenty controversial this year uh, with Magic fans and, and um, with the level of his play, especially with considering his contract. Um, if, if the Magic decided to move on from him, they really did a good job getting out of a quote-unquote mistake, um, which – I think is a good skill to have as a general manager, being able to get out of your mistakes and, and create flexibility and opportunity. And uh, whether or not, you know, the magic should have held on to Harris for another year and tried to swing him into a bigger name player. He may not have done that at, in, at the pace the magic needed him to. And so uh, I think there would, would have been a better deal in the summer. I think Tobias had actually played really well this year outside of his scoring numbers. Uh, yeah. But uh, at the same time, if this was the peak of his value and you know um, as an organization you've got to take more concrete steps forward, perhaps creating this cap room, essentially, I mean, if they don't re-sign Jennings and they don't re-sign Ilya Sova, they, that creates max cap space in and of itself, uh, especially with the Fry deal. That, you know, that they, they're guaranteed to have max cap space this summer, I believe, even with Evan Fournier's cap hold and Jason Smith's cap hold, um, along with – yeah, they could have two, potentially two max cap cap spaces, or max salary spaces, and if that's the ultimate goal, then they accomplish that goal. Um, the big question I think is, does that mean the Magic have given up on this season? What what are they supposed to tell fans who believe that this was a playoff season? That's I think that's the question that that really needs to be answered uh, when when you assess this deal. Yeah, and you and me both agree on this. They were never going to be a playoff team this year. Yeah, that they were. Never's improved. a strong word. Never's a strong word. I, I, on balance, I did not think they were, but there was certainly a universe where they made the playoffs. Oh, okay. I guess I was the only person that never thought there would be a playoff <laughs> team this season. Then, um, but you know, you and I have both been pretty solidly in that thirty-two to thirty-five win yeah. range for them this season, which is still a win. 
especially if they started to answer the questions that they needed to that they didn't answer last season. And they have. You know, and one of those was, does Tobias Hair fit with the term with an actual coach? And that answer ended up being no. So they went and did a deal that uh, they believe would make them better. You know, now, even if it probably doesn't move the preemptive needle that much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... You know, I think some of the frustration is, I mean, these are, and this is, this is what's going to happen in a rebuild is you invest in young guys and you see which ones stick and everyone, especially the way the magic we're going to struggle with so many different young guys that, that people kind of put their horses behind. I mean, one of the questions that needed to be answered this year is who do the magic continue this rebuild with? Who do they put the, who do they put, you know, their, their chips behind? Who do they put uh, their themselves behind as far as, as far as continuing, um, as far as uh, continuing, uh, I lost my train of thought here, uh, as far as continuing this re this rebuild, uh, how, who do they go with? And, and that's a huge question for this team. And so moving on from Tobias Harris signals that, okay, he's not, he's not going to be the guy that, that leads this group. Um, and it's not necessarily, anything wrong with him. It's just the way the group kind of came together. And that was one of the things the magic needed to do. Yeah. And you know, that's just kind of how things work out sometimes. And I, I think that this really shows that, um, they're bought into Evan form, which, you know, was something that we thought that they very possibly could end up doing because they've, they've said all the right things. They said it with Tobias Harris. They, they said it with Vucevic. You know, they, they want to keep him here long-term, and they, they view him as a long-term piece. Um, but as you can see, we're being joined by a, uh, a good of uh, the Internet. He writes everywhere at this point, I think. Um, Chris. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Uh, Chris, we'll get your thoughts on this. Uh, what did you think of the Tobias Harris trade that the Magic made? I thought it was an absolutely terrible trade. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you you were. I thought the, the return of a player they just resigned to a new contract was just absolutely awful. He's twenty three years old. We saw Jeff Green go for a first round pick today, like. The Magic, ever since that Evan Fournier, Aaron Afalado trade, have not been very good at getting return on their trades. They sent away Mo Harkless for nothing. They've gotten Harris for nothing, for basically nothing. They just sent away Channing Fry for nothing. I guess you can make the argument they're trying to use the cap space, but I feel like you got to be getting more than this. Yeah, and I think that that's a, a feeling that you know Phil and I both share to an extent, but it's impossible to really gauge how good or bad for them these deals are until the coming off season when we see how they end up spending their cap space. If they end up having to go and max out a guy like Ryan Anderson and then, you know, I'm shaking my head. No one can see that. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> you know, somebody else of, you know, that B to C level free agent. Then oh, they're bringing Joey Howard back? <laughs> well, um, that's a that's a whole other discussion for a whole other day. But um, you know, if if they end up having to spend their cap space on two guys at that level, then you can probably look back and say that these deals were a failure for them. Um, but Chris, you cover another Southeast Division team, the Hornets. They made a nice little move on. Tuesday getting Courtney Lee. What kind of impact do you think that that has on them and their playoff chances moving forward, even with Michael Kidd Gilchrist being out for the season? I think it only improves their uh, chances at the playoffs. I wrote an article once the deadline ended. It's over up on at the Hive right now, actually, um, about how their expectations for the post deadline and they've kind of changed how 
at the beginning of the season, it was very much they got to at least make the playoffs. It's playoffs or bust. And obviously they had that really hot start, and then the injuries kind of tripped them up, so we're not really sure what the real Hornets team is. But I feel right. like I feel like based on the way they've been playing lately, based on the fact that they've been hanging around the playoffs even with all the injuries and they're finally starting to get healthy again, that the Courtney Lee edition should put them right into the playoffs. At this point, making the playoffs is just like the general expectation of the team. It should be how we all view them. Like If they don't make the playoffs, it's a failure of the Hornets, not of other teams being better than them. Because I feel like they're better than the Wizards at this point. Now, maybe Markeith Morris has a revolution over there and changes things. The Pistons obviously got better as well, getting Harris and, uh, and Donuts. Donuts. Let's, just, let's just call them Donuts. Yeah, and Donuts. <laughs> that, was, that, that was a very nice trade for them. That was a nice trade. Stan Van Gundy cleaned up as, as he usually does at everything. I, yeah, I would, getting that trade, to putting Detroit right into the playoffs. Chicago didn't really get that much better, in my opinion. I mean, maybe Jimmy, Jimmy Butler is obviously one of the best players in the NBA, so that could change things, but... I just don't see how Charlotte's not in the playoffs in somewhere that eight to six seed right now. And if they play the way they did at the beginning of the season, while fully healthy with Courtney Lee, you could see them jumping all the way up to a four seed if things fall in line for them. Will that happen? Probably not, but it's like where their ceiling could be. Yeah, and going into this season, I was probably in the minority. I thought that the Hornets were going to be a team that would really threaten for an Eastern Conference playoff spot. I, I like the addition of Nicholas Batum, and he's really had a resurgence this year and made himself a, a very sought-after free agent this uh, this coming offseason. Uh, I'm going to start with you on that. Ends up being the biggest winner um, at the deadline. Uh, I, you know, I think the biggest winner has to be Detroit. Um you know, we, we've, we've watched Tobias Harris a lot here. Uh, there, there are flaws to his game, but, but like Chris said, he's only 23 years old. He's still got a lot of growth, poten- a lot of growth potential. Um, you know, I think he's going to end up being on a reasonable deal if he can, if he can produce at the level he was, he, we know he can produce at. Um, I think really the, the, the fault in, in Tobias Harris was just the way the Magic used him. I think they – Signed him knowing they would eventually trade him. I don't think they planned to or expected to trade him this quickly. And, and I think that's part of the frustration among among Magic fans. Uh, I'm sure all of our phones are about to buzz uh, after that. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, we know he can play really, really well. I, I like I like the move from Detroit to get him, to get Donatus Montiunis. Uh, you know, they're at a stage where they're ready to make the playoffs. Uh, you know, Stan... Pushes them to that limit. They've got a they've got a great player in Andre Drummond, and you know with Reggie Jackson, Tobias Harris, and Andre Drummond there, they've got a really nice future. And what's still a pretty packed Eastern Conference, but I, it seems like a very unsettled Eastern Conference. A lot of the top teams seem to be coming down. Um, you know, so yeah, there the, really is only one team that you're kind of really comfortable with outside of Cleveland right now, and I guess that would be Toronto. Exactly. Exactly, and and even even beyond this year, I, Cleveland and Toronto, you know, feel like the most comfortable teams. I think Chicago will always be there um, because they have Jimmy Butler, but even they have some questions. Detroit's firmly in. It, it feels like now Detroit's firmly in that four or five, you know, team group that is. You know, they're going to the playoffs. That they're they're dreaming of more than just making the playoffs. And so to do to really complete that step, maybe with their core in one day or in two days, essentially. Um, I think is is really good. Uh, I also do like what the Clippers did, bringing in Jeff Green, another you know quality, another quality player they can bring off their bench. Um, the Clippers haven't been crazy this crazy this year as far as quality. I don't think it pushes them into the championship conversation, but certainly they'll be a team that can push somebody. And, and if and if they're fully healthy, they're really really dangerous. So um, I like I like bringing in Jeff Green. Um, they didn't give up a ton. They gave up they gave up a first round pick. Um, and dump Lance Stevenson's salary, uh, but for what they're trying to do, trying to win a championship now, you know they they they, they got to push their chips in, and, and so they did that and got a got a quality player in return. Yeah, I I would say that Detroit was you know pretty clearly the big winner. I, they gave up Joel Anthony to get Donatus Eunice and Marcus Thornton to you know add a little bit more punch to that bench. Uh, Chris, do you agree with us that Detroit was a big winner, or do you have somebody else? I feel like Detroit's definitely, as far as 
addition, adding players, I feel like they're kind of the big winner. I can't really think of anyone else that made a big addition today where you can go, oh, that's going to change, like, how they're going to be as a team. Like, maybe the Hornets with Lee, but really I feel like Detroit made a much bigger jump than Lee's going to give the Hornets. Um, I feel like the Hawks kind of actually are winners today by the fact that they didn't trade Al Horford and Kyle Korver and Jeff T, yeah. which they've been rumored to do. Now, it's kind of weird in the fact that those guys might end up leaving anyways, but, you know, sometimes not trading your guys away and just taking the cap room isn't a terrible thing. So I feel like they weren't going to get a decent return on Al Horford because everyone knew he if he left, they could just go sign him in free agency in a year where everyone's going to have cap room. So I feel like not getting rid of those guys and just saying, okay, let's see what we got, and we'll try and make another run. Because this is still the same team that won 60 games last year for the most part. They could still go on a huge run if they get hot and go to the conference finals. Absolutely, and and I think I, and I think this trade deadline was characterized more by the pieces that didn't get moved. Um, yeah. You know, we didn't see Al Horford and Jeff Teague get traded. We didn't see Dwight Howard get traded. Uh, you know, there's talks about Ricky Rubio. He ended up staying. You know, the 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 players that didn't move, Kevin Love would be another one. Blake Griffin would be another Griffin, one. Yeah. Um, not that I think the Clippers were ever going to trade him or the Cavs were ever going to trade Love, but uh, the players that didn't get moved were almost as big as anything. Because I, I agree with Chris. That that good Atlanta team is in there somewhere. Um, it, it, they could awaken at any time because just the way, they, the way they play is they just have to be so precise. And, and when they get it rolling, they're still really, really, really tough to beat. And, and they'll be dangerous in the playoffs even as a, as a lower seed. And so... Um, you know, I, I, I like that Atlanta stood pat. I still think they have the inside track to re-sign Al Horford this summer, although plenty of teams are going to go hard after him. I'm sure the Magic will be one of them. Uh, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see what happens with them this offseason. They've still got some flexibility. Teague's on a really, value, on a really affordable deal, especially under this new cap. Uh, whenever they're ready to hand over the reins to Dennis Schroeder, I'm sure they can still get something for Teague. I, just, I didn't sense the urgency from them to trade Teague at this deadline. Uh, and, and certainly the, the expanded cap room is, is part of that. Really, I feel like the biggest thing we kind of saw with this deadline was we're going to have a crazy summer. Oh, yeah. The draft is going to be nuts. The draft. I don't know if the draft's going to be nuts. I'm more interested in the contracts the players are going to get in summer. Cause oh, yeah. What we saw this deadline was under the current CBA, expiring contracts are useless. No yeah. one wants to trade for them. Unless you're Very. the Orlando well, Magic. It's, it, I mean, expiring contracts are useless... Uh, you know, to an extent. To an extent. Right. Like, You're not going to trade away anything valuable for an expiring contract anymore. Like, well, uh, once 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 the cap settles in, I, I think we'll see that. Like right now, we're seeing such. This is this is a you know, I've said the Magic rebuild has been a rebuild of just bad bad timing, and a big reason is because of the because the uh the cap is just having this crazy crazy rise that no one saw coming, and the league tried to temper it and. Smooth, smooth it out so that that it would hit teams more evenly instead of just bludgeoning everyone, you know, with with the you know side of a you know ru- you know cricket paddle or whatever whatever it's called. It, it it's just it's just happening all at once that everyone gets to reap the benefits, and so no one has any impetus to make these kind of moves that we're used to seeing. I think once the cap settles in and and begins rising incrementally rather than as dramatically as it is, we'll we'll see. The trade deadline. We'll see the trade deadline talks kind of center back around expiring contracts again. But right now, there's no reason to do it because again, everyone's going to have a max slot this summer, essentially. Yeah. Right. And I, I don't think it's a permanent thing. I just think under the current CBA, because we're going to have a, a lockout yeah. of some kind uh, coming up soon. I feel like that's going to mo- make expiring contracts a thing again. But as of now, and as far as any future trades, anyone that's expiring in a year or two, no one's going to give up anything majorly of value when they can just go get them in the summer. And especially a case where it's not, it's a player they're not sure they can get. I mean, you have players like Courtney Lee where you can still move them even if they're expiring because that's just a role player. But some of those bigger names like Ryan Anderson, uh, Dwight Howard, all those guys, just there's no point to giving up uh, quality players for them. Yeah, sh- shifting away from the from the deadline talk a little bit, let's do a little bit of rapid fire here since we were talking about the Eastern Conference playoff picture. I'm going to list off teams I want you guys to hit me with yes or no answers for if they make the playoffs. The Miami Heat. Yes. Yes. 
Wait, um, yes if Chris Bosch comes back. No if he doesn't. Uh... I think, uh, I think they still make it even if Bosch is out, but they barely make it. Yeah, I, I would I would agree that they probably end up making it. Obviously, the Chris Bosch news that came out the other day is, is very fun. bad, and you know it, it could end up costing him his career. Um, Pray, prayers for Chris Bosch. That's just terrible. Yes. Yeah. Um, the Indiana Pacers. No. Yes. Yes, because of Paul George. I, I think that Paul George has been revolutionary for that team I think, this year. I, they just I, haven't been consistent enough for me. They haven't been consistent, but, but you can say that about just about every team in the East. Um, I, 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 the emergence of Miles Turner, I think, is a big turning point for them, and, and, and if he can keep it up for the second half of the season, uh, I, think, I think they get in as well. Uh, obviously, Chris, we know that you, you feel that the Hornets will end up making it this season. Uh, Phil... Um, I think they don't make it. I'm I'm sticking to my guns. I think that they end up making it. You know, maybe they only end up as the eighth seed, but I think they make it. Uh, Chicago. If Jimmy Butler is healthy, yes, they should make it. Either way, they're kind of in the same boat as Miami. I think they're going to make it. I'm going to change my Indiana to yes and give a no to Chicago. Whoa. Okay. Uh, the Detroit Pistons. Yes. Yes. The Washington Wizards. Yes. No. I think they, they're... they You kind of have to it. say no. You said yes to everyone I know, else. exactly. I'm, I'm trying to do the math. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to do math here. It's, it's, it's dangerous. And then the last team we'll go with is the Magic. No. No. We did actually have a, a Twitter... Twitter question. Someone, someone oh. ca- calling us out. Um, at at Casey Dodd at Dodgeball with two Ds says a, a few games back of eighth seed, and this is a lost season where we were never making the playoffs. Seems premature. Um, Wait, who's a, what's a lost season? That this season is a lost season for the Magic. Because oh, Zach, Zach and I both, Zach and I both felt even when the team was winning that, that there were holes and that they were probably going to fade and, and miss the playoffs and. Uh, thanks, Casey, for, for the interaction. We do appreciate it. And, and certainly the Magic are not out of it. Um, I think, you know, we talked a lot about the cap room that this that this deal created for the Magic. Uh, but on the court, yeah, the, the, it's still not 100% sure that this Magic. is going to be a deal that makes the team demonstrably better than what they were with Tobias Harris. And I think that's our skepticism. And I'm not saying they fall out of the playoff conversation, but I just think there are there are a lot of teams that climb over a very difficult schedule, and a lot of questions about what they just got in the short term that, that you know, makes me wonder if they'll be in the, the – I mean, I didn't think they'd make the playoffs anyway, but I don't think they'll make the playoffs even more now. Yeah, lo- looking ahead at their schedule, they still have Dallas twice, Golden State twice, they get the Pacers twice, Chicago, I believe, two, possibly three more times. I think they get them two more times. Yes, they do. They get the Heat uh, two more times. That's a home and home, if I'm not mistaken. It is. Um, they still have to play Memphis in Orlando. They have to go back out west again. Oh, no. I mean, they, their their schedule. But they get is, the Lakers on that West Coast trip. Yeah, th- that West Coast trip, admittedly, isn't as bad. You know, outside of the Golden State game. But teams just play bad out west, no matter what. Like even when yeah. it's easy. Yeah, they, they get Golden State, the Lakers. Orlando lost to Phoenix earlier this year on a West Coast trip, and that was the, the go-home game, too, so you never know. Yeah, and the Magic's march is just absolutely brutal. They're, they're paying for that trip to London earlier in the season. So, you know, if they end up winning 10 or 11 more games, I, I think you really consider the season a success because, look – you're much improved from last season. Even if it's only seven to eight wins, that that's a pretty decent size improvement in an improved decent conference. Yeah, I wouldn't say this is a lost season at all for them. Uh, honestly, they at the way they started the year, they played so much better than I ever thought they were going to play. I still feel I projected them around 35 wins. I still feel like they can exceed that. 
I feel like when you come to the end of the season and you reach that point where you start playing teams that are tanking and teams that are resting, they could really sneak up to 40 wins. I still don't think they're going to make the playoffs, but I could see them at least hanging around there for a while. I don't think it's going to be a lost season at all. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's definitely, I mean, I, I don't consider it a lost season if you hit 35 wins and if you're ending up, what, three, four games out of the playoffs. I think that would be a success for this group. This, I mean, until until Tuesday, this was essentially the same group that won 25 games a year ago, and, and you can't ever lose sight of that. Uh, they needed to experience winning. They needed to experience playing games under pressure. They needed to experience, you know, being you know, pissed off that they can't finish games and, and try to figure that out. And, and yeah, it's frustrating right now, and it certainly spurred change in the Magic realized they needed to make some moves to, to help them get to the next step, whatever that next step is in the next in the next year. But they're, they're accomplishing a lot of the things that I think they needed to accomplish. Um, they're beginning to answer questions about the roster, and again, I, and I think the Tobias Harris trade is, is a sign of this, they're picking who they want to be part of the long-term, you know, final picture of this team. And you know they've got they've got to pick some guys and, and and another another follower interacted on Twitter, you know said Victor Oladipo is the next guy. He's the next decision point for this team. Um, they obviously got Evan Fournier's ex, uh, contract free agency this this summer, but Oladipo is due for an extension this summer too. That could be how they use their their max space, you know possibly, um, which would be a humongous risk as well because Victor's been up and down up and down as well. And so the Magic answering these questions and and coming to these decisions about the future of their franchise making moves to take that next step to becoming a surefire playoff team is a good thing and is a signal to me that this season has had some form of success. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you on that point. We're getting to about the 32-33 the minute mark here, so we'll go ahead and start wrapping up shop. Um, Chris, since you're our guest, we'll start with you. What were your, you know final thoughts on the trade deadline, and were you disappointed that there wasn't more movement? I always go with super low expectations on the trade deadline just because there's always the possibility of a 3-4 team move like we had in 2013 where almost absolutely nothing happened, so no big names really got moved, but the fact that we had a handful of trades was good enough for me. I was fine with it. Yeah, I, I think especially after the absolute madness that ensued at the end of the deadline last year. Having a little bit of a slower trade deadline was was good for all of us and, and good for the heart. Uh, Phil, what, what were your opinions on the uh, on the deadline? Uh, you know, as you know, I kind of come in with low expectations too. Uh, it, it's it, I, you, uh, at this time of year you always expect some type of chaos and Especially on the Magic front, since that's the team that I follow really closely, uh, the Tobias Harris trade caught me completely by surprise. I, I did not expect them to move him, uh, certainly not for this product. And so, you know, there's, you know, there's always for for someone somewhere, there's always a little bit of chaos at the deadline, and uh, it might be quiet from a national standpoint. It, it might not, you know, have kind of the juicy, you know, sexy blockbusters where a star is getting traded for a star or you know, someone makes that push for the playoffs, but there's always something interesting to take away. And, uh, you know, there's always, you know, Twitter fires to put out. And so uh, <laughs> that's that's what I've been doing for the last two, day, last two days, and that's always my takeaway is, is no matter who it is, the trade deadline, there is, there is chaos somewhere at this time of year. Yeah, and I, I think that that was something that we all kind of expected. We... we you know, thought that there was the potential for a big deal, um, but you know, at the end of the day, teams weren't just going to give up their players for nothing. Uh, before we close up shop here, we got a, another question from our good friend Eric Lopez. Uh, where does the Tobias Harris trade rank among the most stunning, controversial Magic trades in franchise history? Um, Phil, Katina Mobley is number one. <laughs> Casino Mobley was a good one. The most stunning, the most stunning trade in franchise history to me was undoubtedly Bo Outlaw getting traded to the Phoenix Suns in a three-team deal that netted the Magic only Jud Bushler. Oh my it's God! Not, it's not only, that hockey guy. No, 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 no. That uh, no, that was not John Weisbrot. I believe that was a John Gabriel deal. Um, 
the Bo Outlaw was the heart and soul of the team. I remember being in school and someone telling me the Magic traded Bo Outlaw, and I was like, "What? What? What did they get for him?" And they they told me Jud Busher. I'm like, "What?" <laughs> and not only and and if you look on Basketball Reference, not only did the Magic trade Bo Outlaw in that deal, if I'm not mistaken, they traded the pick that ended up being Amare Stoudemire. Of course they did. Of course they did. So that one was, was, I mean, you didn't know it was Amari Stoudemire at the time, but trading Bo Outlaw was absolutely one of the most stunning in-season trades I've, I've ever seen from the Magic. Um, it was completely out of left field for me. It was pre-internet age, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I was, I, was, I was floored by it. It was, you know, it was like having your heart ripped out, even though you still had Daryl around. So. Could you have uh, always yeah. in for me? Because I specifically remember turning on the TV and I don't know if they were interviewing Mobley or uh, Wiserod. I'm specific, specifically remembering them interviewing someone about the trade. And, like, he was out there for warm-ups for the game. He was game. out there for warm-ups in Boston. And had to be pulled from the game, from warm-ups, to go, be told, to go get traded. Like, yeah. Who trades someone five minutes before a game? In January. It wasn't even at the deadline. It was in January. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that I might have to go with the Mobley trade. Because that had a trickle down effect to Steve Francis, who yeah. then the other, oh, sorry. then uh, turned him crazy and <laughs> derailed his time in Orlando. The other, the other, the other stunning, most surprising trade, and this one, this one might be up there too. Um, I was at a, a season ticket holder event. You know, my family was were season ticket holders, so we were at an event at Point Orlando uh, on trade deadline. I think it was the day before the trade deadline. You know, hanging out with T Mac, hanging out with Mike Miller, hanging out with all with Sean Kemp, and I get home and I pop on the like CBS Sportsline message boards, and Mike Miller's been traded to the Memphis Grizzlies for <laughs> Drew Gooden and Gordon Gearcheck, and I'm like, I was just shooting hoops with Mike Miller like 20 minutes ago. What ha- What the hell happened? Hey, so we got one. we got the immortal Drew Gooden. <laughs> yeah, you know that that. That happens sometimes. Uh, random happen in season sometimes. Thank you, uh, Elo, for the question. We always uh, enjoy when you chime in and, and have good stuff for us to think about. Um, but we're getting close to 40 minutes here, so we'll go ahead and wrap up shop. Uh, first off, Chris, thank you for joining us. Let everyone know where they can find you, where they can read your work, why why you do this. Why do you do this to yourself? <laughs> I write for At The Hive, Hardwood Paroxysm, Friendly Bounce, and uh, recently I'm probably going to start writing over at Hawk's Hoop again because uh, Bo Charney asked me to help him out over there. So why do this? I love basketball. <laughs> yeah, so as you can see, you can actually find Chris everywhere on the internet. Oh, and Basketball and, Breakdown. Yes. And oh, yeah, nice. It, if you run a website and you're looking for a semi-quality writer, you can always... Ask Chris, and he will probably come and write for your website for little to no cost, and then he'll non trash. He'll he'll try to get the editor traded because he hates them. It's my um, website now. <laughs> Actually, yeah. this, this is my podcast now. Get out of here. This is mine. Hey, uh, my video is not working, so uh, so certainly certainly you could easily make a coup, and I wouldn't see it coming. <laughs> Literally. <Yeah. laughs> um, as always, you can find. Phil online, and you can read all of his work there, as well as the baby of the family, Orlando Sports Daily, which Phil is working on trying to to build up and turn into uh, Orlando Magic Daily's love child brother. Exactly, um, exactly. You you see, if basketball is not cooperating, no. Um, uh, let's not talk about they that. They rarely do. Uh, UCF, not talk about that. UCF softball might be the uh, the turning point for um, Orlando Sports Daily. And for myself, you can all over NBA and all of my work over at Orlando Pinstripe Post. We're going to have a lot more coming up regarding what the Magic did and what they can do moving forward. But thank you for, to everyone for, for coming and checking us out tonight. We hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we look forward to getting to do this some more as the uh, season wind down. So take care, everyone. 
Yeah, thanks everyone for, for, for watching and listening wherever you may be. We'll hopefully, Zach and I hopefully be back very, very soon with, with another episode of Orlando Magic Live. Uh, thanks to Chris, thanks to Zach, thanks to me, and no thanks to, to my camera. We'll see you all next time. Later.